Good evening, everyone, and I'd like to uh, begin by thanking uh, Professor In Seok Moon for the very kind invitation to the second enthusiasm uh, webinar run by the uh, Korean Enos and Throat Society. And I thought I'd introduce you this evening to a slightly newer concept for maybe your surgical armamentarium that might be relevant in the upcoming years. And this is the idea of underwater endoscopic ear surgery. And so just as a general overview, we'll talk tonight about why we might consider underwater endoscopic ear surgery. Some of the early beginnings, uh, looking at opening the inner ear, specifically cochlear implantation, underwater and how that may impact or influence uh, hearing outcomes. And then I'll move on to the most common or I think the most relevant uh, for otologists, and that is the management, endoscopic management of cholesteatoma, particularly of fistulae and then talk about some now more recent evidence regarding superior canal dehiscence repair, particularly transmastoid underwater repair. And then we'll finish with just some general ideas about piezo surgery and potential future directions. So of course, the main reason we would consider underwater endoscopic ear surgery is when we have a lot of blood in the field and we're trying to dissect delicately around the inner ear. So potentially we might have better visualization and if we're specifically talking about fistulae management of the inner ear, then we could potentially have less heat and potential less uh, pneumo labyrinth that might occur when we're dissecting in this way. But specifically what we're talking about is this idea of when we're opening the inner ear and you're surrounding fluid around the inner ear when you're opening it up is of a similar composition salt wise to the inner ear then this may have a relative protective effect when we're opening the inner ear. Now this is not a new idea and some work has been uh, published for over the last 10 years or so and here's some interesting work from Germany published in 2016 in Otology Neurotology and what they had here was they had uh, control groups where they uh, did historical co control cohort study and then they performed a standard canal wall up mastoidectomy and posterior tympanotomy but then filled the middle ear and inserted the cochlear implant underwater and they filled the middle ear with ringer solution and here they've demonstrated to us that the that ringer solution is of a very similar salt concentration to the perilymph and the scalar tympani and you can see with the dotted lines in the graph here and this is looking at um, hearing level gains with a short and long term analysis you can see with the dotted lines there's a significant improvement in hearing outcomes relative to what was previously occurring when they were doing this as a dry insertion and so this maybe implies that if we surround the cochlea with solution that's similar to the perilymph and we do our manipulation of the inner ear this might be relatively more protective and this has of course uh, been demonstrated since then when we've applied this technique or this is specifically a Japanese group and a lot of the work comes from Japan or China where they're using an endosheath uh, like we use in endoscopic sinus surgery and filling the external auditory canal and using this as a method of potentially performing hydromastoidectomy or in fact doing underwater drilling and you can see here this paper from just last year demonstrating how antral and attic dissection can occur trans canal using an underwater technique. Now I feel probably the best current application of underwater endoscopic ear surgery is in the managing of cholesteatomatous fistulae and you can see this work was published some seven years ago by Yamakuchi's group and he subsequently published a different series of fistulae repair and this is what I'll focus a lot of the attention of this talk on and that is looking to manage the situation of cholesteatomatous fistulae which occurs in around 5 to 10 percent of cholesteatoma case, cases as a complication in Western literature and this may certainly be higher in, uh, in more developing countries and in terms of frequency the commonest location is the lateral semicircular canal and you can see a coronal image in the top part of this slide of a right ear and we can see the cholesteatoma with a fistula noted into the lateral semicircular canal. The second commoner site is actually the cochlea or the over window and here an axial left CT scan uh, where we're demonstrating a fistula into the cochlea with cholesteatoma and then below that in terms of frequency comes the superior and the posterior semicircular canal when we're talking about fistulae just as a slight digression from underwater endoscopic ear surgery CT scan is of course fairly mandatory 
and we notice that associated erosions are highly correlate with the labyrinthine fistulae. And when we're looking at 0.5 millimeter slices, there's a relatively high sensitivity and specificity to establish whether there's membranous erosion when the fistulae is smaller. When the fistulae gets larger, it becomes a little bit l less sensitive and specific in terms of determining whether there's direct membranous erosion. MRI scan is used in some centers to help add with the diagnosis and when we're looking on the MRI scan, looking at a T1 scan with gadolinium or a loss of signal on T2 may indicate labyrinthitis and some newer techniques published just some eight or nine years ago using 3D cysts and 3D flare in papers published by Sone and, and co-authors in 2012 said that it may uh, give us a better functional prognosis of the INE rather than the CT scan and the size of the fistula. So some units are using an MRI scan. In terms of a grading system, we generally are using the Dornhofer system, which has been around now for over 20 years, the dornhofer Milewski classification, where type 1 is essentially an erosion of the bone with leaving an intact endosteum. Type 2 variably looks at opening the perilymphatic space but not disturbing the membranous labyrinth and type 3 is when there's a membranous labyrinth erosion and you can see here two examples coron in uh, coronal imaging and the right ear of fistulae into the lateral semicircular canal and generally when there's a membranous breach the greater the breach generally the worse the bone line can be expected and this is of course intuitive now, for many decades, the approach to managing fistula has been debated, and there's no real comparative or randomized trials. We're looking at different results. But certainly the method that's occur that uh, is dictated in various institutions is usually based on institutional preference or the surgeon's preference and concurrent pathology. But there's been radical mastoidectomy descriptions, series of canal wall down and canal wall up, and more recently, endoscopic approach has been used to manage fistulae. Michael Gluth and co-authors John Lim and Michael Gluth published just uh, four years ago this systematic review and showed that there was generally poor levels of evidence for managing fistulae and the key question is um, is there any difference in hearing outcome if we remove or leave the matrix and it seems to be that there's nothing that we can find in the literature but intuitively it's probably better to completely remove the disease because you have are less ongoing inflammatory burden within the inner ear. So this seems to be logical that whenever we can, we'd like to remove all of the disease from within the inner ear. Now the question of steroids has also been debated and there tends to be a trend towards improved hearing with the use of intravenous steroid on induction and certainly there'd be no harm in using steroid on neuropathies if we're uh, dry dissecting. There seems to be no clear evidence for its use postoperatively but in general I think it's wise to consider recommending it if there's no contraindications. In general, the hearing results, and specifically the bone conduction results, probably are better when the membranous labyrinth is not in, uh, open, when intravenous steroids have been used on induction. Generally, there are better hearing outcomes with semicircular canal fistula compared to vestibular cochlear fistula, and this, of course, seems intuitive because, of course, the involved auditory hair cells are further away in a semicircular canal fistula. And there's debate about whether plugging or resurfacing has any difference, and these days I think there's a trend towards plugging off the canal. I think those of us that do trans, mastoid, superior, semicircular canal closure tend to get more confidence when we plug off the canal, and this seems to imply that there could be less ongoing labyrinthitis when we're managing the cholesteatoma. Now the underwater method, as I mentioned to you, has been around for several years now, and this is the actual method that I use. I tend to use a 4 millimeter, 18 centimeter scope, and this is transmastoid typically, so I'll do a canal wall up mastoidectomy. We use the endoscrub attachment from the Medtronic Corporation, and typically I use a 3 liter bag of Hartmann's or Ringer's, and that's heated to body temperature, and we add dexamethasone to that solution. If I'm working in the mastoid bowl, as you can see with this video uh, in the top right-hand corner of the screen, you can see with the picture I took in the bottom right-hand corner that I often stabilize the scope over the sigmoid sinus because otherwise the, sigmoid, the, the scope tends to wobble quite a lot and we stabilize it with a Raytec. One thing that does tend to occur when we do the surgery underwater is that we tend to get a slight magnifying effect. And this is work from Yamuchi's article that was published in Professor Kakahata's uh, book on innovations in endoscopic ear surgery. And here the scope is placed in an identical position. And you can see the effect of 
uh, underwater magnification of about 30% magnification and a slightly clearer view that occurs as we're washing away all of the debris. And this is important when you're beginning to do this sort of case to compensate for these sort of factors. Here's an example of a case we did last year in a patient where they had a right lateral semicircular canal fissure in a 56-year-old male who'd have previous childhood ear infections. And here's a canal wall up mastoidectomy in the right side with the disease burden noted on the medial aspect of the antrum and over the genicular ganglion. And in front of the, oh, in the region of the sort of ampullated end of the superior semicircular canal. And you can see now that we've started the irrigation. The irrigation here is with an endo scrub and it's with Hartman's solution filled with dexamethasone and you can see we're using a round knife here to remove the actual cholesterol from within the fistula and you could notice that the CT scan sort of underestimated the degree of erosion that we found when we were doing the surgery and here the disease is being removed in the suprageniculate region so we take a bulk of the cholesterol out and you can see that there's remaining squamous epithelium in the suprageniculate ganglion sorry, the suprageniculate region where we're removing it off the tegmen and then around the region of the ampullated end of the superior semicircular canal and then towards the genicular ganglion. You can sti still see there's some disease within the inner ear and ultimately all of this disease is removed. And then we use a composite cartilage graft from the tragus to cover the region and resurface that with some bone pate that was harvested during the cortical mastoidectomy as you can see here and preoperatively have we had a bone line that was relatively normal which you can see in the upcoming audiogram and postoperatively we were relatively lucky with just a drop off in the bone line in the in the 1000 2000 and 4000 kilohertz range but certainly very adequate and that's 6 months postoperatively so in summary labyrinthine fistula tend to be most accurately diagnosed with CT. You may want to consider the use of perioperative steroids and the removal of matrix is preferable. In terms of a systematic review, the cartilage and bone repairs tend to get equivalent results and the underwater dissection may be useful. One of the uh, counter arguments to the underwater dissection that we can see, even though I mentioned to you the pros, which could be better visualization, less heat and less potential for human labyrinth. One of the cons could be that if we're irrigating for a long time, there's a large volume exchange with the perilymph and we don't really know the long term effects of this, but we'd have to suspect that there could be more long term progressive hearing loss than uh, uh, and so we have to be careful and probably this will be the uh, source of future research in this area. Now another application of underwater endoscopic e-surgery is for superior canal dehiscence. This was uh, published some four years ago again from Dr. Yamuchi's group where we're performing and this is quite a standard approach now a transmastoid superior semicircular canal plugging for superior semicircular canal dehiscence. And here it was a first published report and subsequently he's had a series of six that he's published with very minimal changes in the bone line. And here's an example of one case of mine where the patient had a superior semicircular canal dehiscence on the right hand side and I performed a standard canal wall up mastoidectomy demonstrating the lateral semicircular canal and the superior semicircular canal and then moved to an underwater technique to open the superior semicircular canal and here you can see we're plugging with some fascia the posterior and the anterior aspect and then draining the fluid away and covering that with bone pate and subsequently some perichondrum. And this patient as well had a similarly good result in terms of their superior canal dehiscence symptom improvement. This patient presented I with just a, as a side, complete I'd, facial paralysis I'd, uh, and let, I won't, I'll fistula. let my, my own voiceover go After over this talk, but this is a case that we did uh, during he had a COVID, and, and you can see how we use the underwater dissection technique to try and minimize the mastoidectomy images, the and to minimize aerosolization. And lateral semicircular canal dehiscence can be seen. The procedure began with an incision of the webbing posterior superiorly in the previous canal wall down mastoidectomy, noting that we were trying to minimize any drilling at all during this case and any aerosolizing. The bulk of the cholesterol was removed with a round knife and with long Thomason instruments to reveal the medial lining of the cholesterol and matrix. This can be seen 
in the upcoming image here where the facial nerve and the fistula are outlined. A 4mm scope with endoscrub was then used to do the dissection underwater where matrix was removed from the clastiotoma. Hartman's at body temperature with dexamethasone was used for irrigation solution. Here the anterior part of the matrix has been removed and a stubborn amount of matrix medial to the facial nerve in retrofacial area and in the posterior aspect of the fistula is removed under direct vision using a short Thomason dissection tool and as mentioned before 37 degree irrigating Hartman solution was used with dexamethasone instilled into the Hartman's. You can see the excellent view that we get in the retrofacial region with the use of the ongoing irrigation. The clesiotoma remnant was then completely removed and the region was then repaired using a composite cartilage graft. And I'll show you the uh, ultimate result at three months post-op here. And at six months, the patient had a complete return to full uh, facial nerve function after this dissection. I wanted to just conclude with a short discussion of piezo surgery, which is, of course, another version of underwater ear surgery. And uh, here, the piezo, which has been around for about 15 to 20 years, initially used in dental and uh, orthodontic as well as maxillofacial applications has been brought to the ear, nose and throat region in the form of rhinoplasty and within the ear and for 10 to 11 years now it's been used within the ear. It's a low frequency ultrasonic device that produces ultrasonic frequencies in the region of 25 to 30 kilohertz with micro vibrations and the big question is should we use it on the inner ear really? This has been debated. Certainly there's been work published some 10 years ago where it seemed quite safe in series expa uh, spanning over four years. And then more recent work published in uh, 2011 where there was some discussion as to whether using the piezo over the cochlea caused uh, significant damage to the uh, outer hair cells and the inner hair cells in rat cochlea. There's been human trials where there's been comparative data for stapedotomy using a microdrill CO2 laser and piezo. And you can see with the postoperative air bone gaps that the best results seem to be with the CO2 laser. And the certainly in the higher frequency, some of the worst results with the piezo. So this might imply that the ultrasonic range in which the piezo is working may be causing some damage to the inner ear. More recently, a colleague and friend of ours, uh, Adrian James, just a couple of months ago with his uh, group and Jennifer Sue being the lead author, performed a study uh, on marsupials and they demonstrated a significant loss in auditory brainstem response when the piezo was used when scalloping bone off the long process of the malleus. And so, in conclusion, the authors cautioned the use of the piezo around the ossicles. And so I think in summary, if we're looking at piezo surgery, it's certainly a very useful adjunct when we're dissecting around the attic region, and it prov provides clear visualization with a very neat bone cuts and can get us very nice dissection around a clostridioma sac, but we probably need to use it with caution around the acicular chain and inner ear. And just to conclude, looking at some future directions of underwater endoscopic ear surgery, here's a paper we published a couple of years ago using the piezo in a patient who was already anacoustic and getting progressive tinnitus. So you can see in these axial left-sided T1-weighted images with ganolinium a progressive cochlear schwannoma growing towards the apex of the cochlea causing progressive tinnitus. So here we performed an underwater dissection where we used the piezo since the hearing was already gone and the idea here is to very neatly demonstrate removal of approximately one quarter of the cochlea so that we could gain access with an angled endoscope and view and remove under direct visualization the cochlear schwannoma and insert the cochlear implant to work as a tinnitus suppression device. And this worked very well as a tinnitus suppression device as we might expect since the spiral ganglion neurons are still intact and also gave the patient very useful hearing function. So this is almost the opposite of soft surgery here where this, this Stefan Plonke idea of using uh, essentially dental flossing out the cochlea using a well he used a proline suture and here we're using the depth gauge to push out the remaining cochlear tumor and then insert an advanced off stylet cochlear implant 
and you can see that ultimately we put the advanced stylet implant in and repair just with composite cartilage graft and lay the tympanic membrane back down again and this patient had a uh, very successful return of hearing and loss of tinnitus. So with that once again I'd like to uh, thank Professor In Seok Moon for the very kind invitation and I hope to see you all live next year in Kyoto or sometime next year when all the borders I'm sure will all be open. Once again thank you for your attention.